I think it's interesting when you look at stats. Stats are as good as stats want to be. You, know, you can make them up, you can put names, you can invert your commas around them. And in actual fact, they're only as good as actually what you realise they kind of come out to be. Uh, and some of my stats are similar, some of mine are different. But when I thought about the predictability of snow and ski boarding injuries, I thought, okay, look, there's got to be some sort of mathematical formula behind skiing injuries and predictability of skiing injuries. But actually, when I came to maths, all I think it was a chaos theory. So actually, it all kind of went out the window. But instead, I thought, be simple, be really smart, be really simple. So I thought, well, okay, look, if you take this, and this is a picture from Avore, as, and you're looking down the valley, and you've got on the left hand side, kind of hanging over this side, you've got Champersan, you've got Crozet running down here, you've got Switzerland over the top, it's the Chavanet, the wall, you've got the air chair, Brighton Beach over here, you've got uh, Morzine at the back as well. So I thought if you add some mountains and you add uh, some snow to it, you're going to end up with this. And I think, okay, so we're good, the formula's working. If you now add this and you add some of these lot to it, you're going to get something as well. But the problem is about predictability of skiing injuries. We know that if you add borders and skiers to mountains, you don't always get the same result. So you've got to divide it by certain factors. And those factors would be whether you're having a big day in the powder, you know, whether you're practicing your big GS turns and super G turns, you know, whether you're a woman and you're maybe a beginner, or you're actually standing by the side of the slopes, you know, whether you're an elephant on the skis, or depending on what skis you're wearing yourself. But also how much beer you drink at lunchtime, what the weather's going to be like, whether you're just having fun out there, doing whatever, or what boots you have. And that's right, there is an elephant in the room. Because we don't know what this leads to. We have no idea whether it's been successful, had a great day thrashing down through powder, or it's going to end up in failure and you end up on your ass. Now the thing is, most skiing injuries are actually low speed injuries, very, very few of them are high speed injuries. But there's been very little good research and in-depth research looking at actually where the predictability sits in it. So can we be predictable? Uh, this is done by the, uh, the FIS, which is the Federation International de Ski, or the, 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 the French International Skiers. They looked at all their World Cup skiers. And I'm only looking at two bands here between the Alpine skiers and snowboarders. Uh, and the figure on the left-hand side is the number of skiers which actually happened. There are 11,000 in this study, and the percentages are in the brackets. And there's some notable numbers sitting in here. So things like knees, we know that 37% of the Alpine skiers, uh, you know, downhill skiers, they get injured. That's 103 skiers, that's 37%. And borders, quite a few as well. Uh, we also know that more borders have shoulder problems and clavicle problems, you know, fractures. Uh, we also know that back starts becoming a problem as well, you know, up to 10%. Uh, and certainly we know that wrists also give problems for borders too. Uh, and also there is uh, a thumb here which skiers as well at 10%, which I've got to put in. So that's great. So we're now looking at elite level skiers. They're thrashing down. We've now got some semblance of maybe a predictability scale. There's an issue though, because this is Bodie Miller, and he's one of the most successful male skiers that's been around. He's... Uh, American, he's won World Cups, he's won Olympic golds. In actual fact, he's won gold in all five disciplines. So he's your geezer, he's on Time magazine. He's got to be okay, he's one of the A-team guys. But I love it, he's the Marshall Wild style. You know, the way how he skis, you know, his line is much sharper. You know, he sits down, he sits backwards, he's got much sharper edges, he's got much greater uh, uh, door selection through his ankle. This is our skier. The problem is though that I cannot compare him to my patient. Okay, they're chalk and cheese. So actually, a lot of the research which is done on World Cup skiers and international skiers has no relevance at all to this guy over here. There is very little that we can extrapolate one to the other. So what do we do with it? Uh, ben Hassler in the BJSM, he had a nice bit of research came out a couple of years ago, and he was looking about, you know, are there risk factors? And even though his study was pretty small and it was over a short time period, he said most of the skiers who were injured were blokes and they were 40 years old. They're, slaying, they're skiing slowly, so we know that, so it's low impact, it's not high impact stuff. But I love this stuff. It says the chance of injury to increase when I had a readiness for risk. Okay, these are the people who want to go for the jumps and the moguls. They don't stick on the, on the blues and the greens. They want to go for the reds and the blacks. You know, Brian was saying you know, if you have new ski equipment, you're going to injure yourself much more. If you're on powder or old snow, and they call this aggressive snow, it's low humidity, it's the stuff from the snow cannons, that will also increase your injury risk. But this bloke here who's 40, you know, this is the average bloke in London. They want to go out, they want to growl, they want to get on and get going, and they will injure themselves much better. They found out that drinking, though, actually doesn't cause too many problems. But there was a research done earlier in the 90s saying actually two or three drinks is not a problem at all, but five or six, this starts to become potentially dangerous. I think that's obvious. But they did say smoking dope, though, isn't a good idea. So we can put something towards that. Uh, thankfully for us, there's these guys over here, and this is the International Society for Skiing Safety. And they have these little jaunts around the world, they meet up. Uh, and this is all taken from a great website called Ski Injury, with, uh, with um, Mike uh, Ingram. And he's a doctor up in Scotland, and he does lots and lots and lots of stuff to it. 
And really, they go around and they discuss the newest trends, they look at uh, anything which is relevant, which is coming out from all the data they accumulate and pull together. And when they were in Japan in 2005, and this is again going Brian with their injuries days, they found that skiers had one or two injuries per thousand days. Boarders initially had probably three days extra, so there was slightly more dangerous boarding than it was skiing. This thing that actually not many people were wearing helmets, so only 20%, wrist guards only 15%, but interestingly the bindings which you get set from your little bloke who you go down to town and you get your ski set up, 70% were wrong. And they, the way how people injure their knees especially seems to be a chain of events. It's not how you ski, but it's actually how your bindings are set, it's about the skis you're in, it's about the snows you're skiing on, and it's also about your endurance. So bindings are really important, and this actually set the French off on, a, on another system, and they set their bindings differently to most people over Europe today. Uh, in Scotland, they found actually most borders collect, uh, collide into each other, and they, you know, that's why they're now wearing helmets, so there's lots of collisions. They also know that actually most people are less than 11 or over 55 in the borders having injuries. And Austria said so the days were coming down, snowboarding days were coming down, but again, the wrist guard type stuff, they had an interesting uh, look at some guys from Australia, and they're finding if you wear a short wrist guard, which is purely on the palmar surface, your chance of injuring and fracturing wrist was three times greater than actually wearing a double-sided one. But it's still four and a half times less than if you don't wear one. So wearing a wrist guard is a really sensible, clever thing to do. You should be doing it. By the time they get to 2011, though, they find the number of wrist guards actually going down. Less people are wearing wrist guards, but more people are wearing helmets. And it's quite a funny, you know, ironic situation, because helmets are £100, wrist guards are 40 quid. But in actual fact, you get many, many more wrist injuries than you do head injuries, but yet more people wear helmets. So there is a thing about money and where's the money spent. The same thing's coming for bindings when they're looking at these as well. People are just not prepared to spend as much at the moment as what they used to. There's a trend, though, which comes out of it, and they looked at trends. And this, this group here in Sugarbush in Vermont, a very, very uh, well-known and famous, and they did the biggest epidemiological study which is out there today. And they've been collecting data uh, since 1972, and they've got over 7 million skiers who have skied on their mountain. There's a, girl, there's a guy called Carl Etninger, and he seems to be the daddy of all ski injuries and collecting ski injuries as well. Uh, and they found since 1972 that all the injuries are down by 55%. So that's great, so skiing is actually getting safer. And they found that the lower room injuries were down by 83%. In the first 17 years of their trial, the numbers went down massively. But in the final 21, it didn't change too much. And the reason uh, why I think it's going to happen is actually you forget that in the 1970s, what people were skiing on, they were skiing on kind of planks of wood, they were like popsicles. You know, they were big and they were tall and they were straight and they were heavy. And people had, you know, short leather boots. So in actual fact, you've got these huge problems with these, uh, you know, these mid-shin uh, fractures, you've got more ankle problems because of just the kit they're skiing on. But actually, at the time you got the end of the 80s, the early 90s, carving skis were starting to come into fashion, these big kind of parabolic skis. So therefore, that's why I think they had this reduction. It's now plateaued. And the ACL tripled up that time. It's now about the same. But in recent years, they think it's dropping by 30% for looking at ACL-type injuries. And I think there are three main things which kind of fall into play as to why there's a decrease. Bindings is one, and bindings now seems to be the biggest thing that people are looking at. So it's actually not down to the way how you ski or what you're skiing on, but it's what you're skiing in. There's lots and lots and lots of money has been spent into bindings. Boots are also now much stiffer as well. So actually having a decent boot case and a decent binding will decrease your risk. And having short tails to your skis makes a big difference as well. So it isn't, it isn't actually the side cut of the ski that's the problem, it's the length of the ski, or it's the length behind the binding that's the problem, because that sits in the ground and that kind of ruptures it. And these little things called uh, Bigfoot, or they're now called uh, snowboards, which you see zipping around in the Alps and, and anywhere else. And they're about this big. And, uh, and they used to have just fixed floor bindings, so the bindings they wouldn't release. You'd clunk into them, you'd stay in them, you couldn't move on top of them. And guys like this, very, very few of them ever had uh, cruciate type problems because they had tiny distances between the end of the binding, the heel, and the end of the ski itself. But they had loads of spiral tibial fractures instead. So they took one thing away, they gave something else. So now most people who've got snow, uh, uh, ski boards or the Bigfoots actually have bindings which release. Uh, the Swiss also got on board as well, and this is a big report done this year out in Bern. And they concluded very, very much the same thing, saying that actually bindings are the most important bit. And Salomon are, are, are now looking at these things called metatronic bindings. And what they do is they can register how you ski and how aggressive you ski, and they can increase the DIN or the ISO settings on them to make the skis either safer or, or more rigid if you're skiing more aggressively on top of it. So they're coming to the same conclusions and they've gone through the whole remit of looking at boots and looking at skis and looking at bindings as well. And they conclude very, very similar things actually. Since the 70s, lots of things have come down. You know, knees not that much difference. Uh, the shorter skis, there's this poor comparison between the elites and the recreational skier that we said before. But this is also interesting here because it now goes away from the males, which are seen in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, saying actually females are much more likely to have injuries. 
Okay, this is going to be knee problems, greater ACLs, and it's in the first three hours of them skiing. And when you look at women, there's a thing between the intercontinental notch is much sharper, there's a difference between the muscle mass between the quads and the hamstrings, uh, the way how they use muscles, uh, DNA d uh, differences, the disproportionate amount of torque they produce compared to their muscle, compared to the size of their ACL, and also during the menstrual cycle as well, just before and just afterwards, there's a greater chance of rupture and cruciate. But there are certain ways that we rupture our cruciate. So in skiing, I think there are three main ways that you can do it. And the first one is called this phantom boot. Uh, and this is a slow speed injury. Uh, it's possibly done pre-carving skis or on the old carving skis when they're kind of much longer. And it's a much more of a flexion internal rotation type injury. And there's six things which happen to have a phantom boot type injury. Okay, this is where your uphill hand is in the air. Okay, your hips are lower than your knees. You've got your uphill ski is unweighted. You've got all the weight on the inside edge of your downhill ski. You're falling backwards and you're facing forwards. And if you put those six things together, you will rupture your cruciate. Okay? And this is why a lot of people think it's a high-speed injury, it's not, it's slow speed. And we'll look at the reasons to why and what you can do to prevent it. But this is certainly one of the reasons, was the main thing when the new carving skis were coming in in the 90s, why people were still rupturing. There's also something called a boot-induced anterior, anterior draw, or a biad injury. And this is essentially this bit here. Okay, so because you've now got a rigid boot on, if you land from a jump poorly, so you can't see where you're going, and you've got straight knees and you land on your heels, the stiff boot then pushes into your calf and shoves it forwards and rubs your cruciate. Okay, or if you're standing by the slope and you're doing nothing at all, and someone comes and knocks into you, that's the same injury doing that. And it's funny, it's generally more skiers that would do it than boarders who will collide into you. A lot of people think it's the boarders who are going to come and crash into you. But in actual fact, because boarders don't have releasable bindings, the bindings don't come off, therefore their bores act like uh, um, sea anchors, and it slows them down. So when you hit behind, it's a bio-type injury. And I suppose then progressing on, this is then now much more of a modern version, which is called the forward twisting fall. Uh, and this is now a high-speed one, and this is, uh, this is Lindsay Vaughan, and she's probably just the same as Bodie Miller is in America. She's won all five disciplines in World Cup uh, and the Olympics as well, and this was her in February. And you can see she's kind of tumbling over the front of her ski, so you catch an inside edge and you go forwards. And she ruptured her cruciate, she had a tibial plateau fracture and a tour of her MCL. But she's probably going to be skiing again this year, so she'll be up there doing it. And they found when looking at injuries like this, the things about bindings, bindings are not designed to stop ACL type injuries. And in most cases, bindings will actually release. The problem is though, they release too late. So the force which is put through your cruciate, your cruciate ruptures, your then boot falls off. So it's the wrong way around. But Paul Etniger, the guy who's from Sugarbush, I was saying before, he's almost like the daddy of doing this. In 95, he put out a pamphlet all over North America to decrease the rate of the phantom boot and the boot juice anterior, anterior draw. And he had a huge 62% reduction in how they rupture their cruciates by giving a really simple advice. So he said you've got to recognise and avoid these situations. So if you see these six things where your hand is drifting behind you, you know, you're going down lower, your uphill ski is unweighted, you've got the weight on the inside of your downhill uh, ski and you're facing downhill, you will rupture your cruciate. So if, if you recognise it, you've got to do certain things about it. So he says try to keep your arms forward. So he says you're trying to pull everything forwards. Get your feet together, get your hands over your skis. Okay? He says don't straighten your legs when you fall, because the problem is you just load up that downhill ski so therefore you get more chance of having an injury. And I love this bit, but I think that we should be telling all our patients, when you're down, stay down. Don't try and get up. And that's what people do, they're kind of falling down. They sit down, they kind of pull themselves back up again, and that's how they ping their cruciate. So when they're down, stay down, don't try and do it. So don't land on your hand, not only for wrist injuries and hand injuries, but you just create a much acuter angle between your knees so your, so your cruciate does it that way around instead. And these things are really simple that I think patients need to be told to prevent these injuries. So it doesn't, so it doesn't change the forward flexion one, but it does the, the phantom boot and the, uh, the boot-induced anterior draw. But borders do get a bad rap in all of this, and I quite like this quote. I have no idea who Dave Berry is, but I quite liked it. You know, and are they a menace? I think it's right how they see it, and the borders, they're young and they're cool and they're out there doing this stuff. But in actual fact, they had a look in Taos, uh, and this is uh, last year by David Russ, and Taos is in New Mexico and America, and pre-2008, there was no boarding at all on the mountain. It was purely a ski, and they said these fantastic little boot stickers saying free Taos. And the injury rate was, you know, was, was 200 per 100,000 mountain visits. But after the borders came in, it was up by 13%. But actually, most of these injuries were upper limb injuries, they weren't lower limb injuries. But actually, the mountain use went up by 22%. And because generally borders seem to be younger and they're slightly more you know, risk taking behaviour, it is actually the boarding that's causing the problem, it's just the people on the mountain. So, borders aren't a menace to snowboarders. We actually got them really kind of well together. 
but looking back over the injuries of when they came in, especially from the early days in 1996, uh, uh, you know, and these are just very, very kind of quick figures put in here. You know, 49% of boarders actually had problems. And the problems about boarding versus skiers is that most boarders don't take lessons. They follow their mates, you know, they've been skateboarding, they've maybe done a bit of surfing, so they don't need to take lessons. And that's why the injury rate is so massive. But again, it's wrist and it's ankle. And again, I think something which is different down here is they wore soft shell boots. And the boots today, people wear these hybrid boots where they have soft inners but slightly harder outers. So therefore they have more control of what their board's doing. And I think this is quite well reflected when the next bit of research was done in 2012. Okay, and now they're looking at this thing called mean days between injuries. And I think this is a much better way of Brian was saying as to how you measure an injury. So basically for a border, you have to have 345 days on a slope before you get injured. Okay, in a ski you've got to have 400. So the higher the number, the less the risk of injury being. And they looked it down to wrist injuries and ACL sprains, because that seems to be the most, most common thing. And again, they found that if you're younger, less experienced than female, and you're a border, you're probably going to injure yourself. So there's some things which are starting to now kind of resonate and come around, and the percentages may be different, but the whole tune of where the predictability goes seems to be running in one direction. And I think she's mentioned helmets as well. You know, does it make you risky? In London, there's lots of lovely stuff about cyclists. You know, if you're a cyclist in London, and you wear helmets, and you're wearing Lycra, you're going to be pushed off the road by a guy on a bike or a car, or a scooter, because they perceive that you're better, so therefore you know, you're know you the ones that are going to be okay. Actually, helmet's not associated with behaviour at all. It's generally the people who board, and these are these guys that are under 40, you know, they, they ski hard, they board hard, they're blokes, lower uh, body mass index, they ski fast, they're those you know, A-type personalities. They're going to injure themselves regardless they don't have a helmet on or off. But everyone should be wearing a helmet. I think, you know, looking at the stats, there's not enough wearing. More boarders wore helmets, skiers less, Kids have to. Uh, and we'll just go to thumbs quickly, because I think looking at predictability of, of injuries, skiers don't really have many upper limb injuries, okay? but they do get thumb injuries where they rupture their ulnar collateral ligament. And it's such a simple injury, but it's such a simple thing to help patients to stop injuring their thumbs. And it's all about how they hold their ski pole. And actually, if you can tell people how to hold their ski, ski pole properly by threading your hand in and then having the pole running down here, the reason is if you're falling down, and you now open your hand, your pole, your pole falls down. If you thread your hand in the top and grab it, if I now let go of my pole, my pole stays here. So it lands in there and I end up rupturing my collateral ligament. So getting someone to hold their pole better, you know it sounds incredibly simple, will decrease your injury risk. So if you put all the facts and figures and pull them together, this is what you end up with. That most people are injured by falls, you know, there are a few by collisions, and a couple who kind of come off lifts a bit funnily. Okay, skiers mostly do MCL because that's that snowplow position, that starting position. ACL sprains and ruptures 15%. Meniscuses, lateral meniscuses seem to be in the research anyway about the more common thing rather than medial meniscuses, which then, you know, questions, and, and I'm sure you can ask David about this at O'Donoghue's unhappy triad where it's MCL, uh, medial um, <coughs> uh, uh, meniscus and ACL. It seems to be more lateralised. But snowboarders have wrists, you know, 25% they're going to injure the wrist, but 50% of those 25% are going to be fractures. We're a risk guide. Uh, and they run through them. And this is ankles, quite interesting. You know, the ankles, 15% of them have this fracture of the lateral process of the talus. And I think this is now a very, very specific snowboarding type injury. So it looks like a sprained ankle, it smells like a sprained ankle, but actually it doesn't really get better and they bruise. And if you're suspected of having someone 10 days later with a sprained ankle from snowboarding, check for this, which is either done on CT or enhanced MR. The problem is, this is our patients, this is my patients, this is, this is what we will do, this is what they have as their day job. They sit there slouched in front of their computer, day in, day out, and they all want to have day jobs like this. And they're going, this is good, I can see there's some similarity between what I do and what they do. Look at that, we're exactly the same. And then we go that far, and you go like that, and you go like that, and they go, hey, I can do my day job, it's not a problem at all. But we kind of know that's not true. So what can we do about it? Because they are going to go out skiing, they are going to injure themselves, they are going to do whatever they want to do. And there are these little predicts of injury, and I think if people have had previous injuries, I think then we will know if it's on the right side, they'll have right-sided problems. So if they've got dissymmetry or asymmetry, we know that's going to have a side where it's going to come into as well. The motor control, the BMIs, and just stupidity will all cause it. So fitness in its most broadest, most obvious terms, I think has to be beneficial, because we have to give them the ability to be better. There are lots of models out there, by the way, that looks at this as well, and this is done by Roland Barr. And he said, if you put all these things together with your predisposed athlete, you then have your susceptible athlete, you then have injury. But I think the notable things that we can make a difference on, so we can actually help them with their joint instability, we can improve their range of motion, we can give them postural stability work, you know, and we can give them the right equipment. 
And perhaps if we have some direct intervention to here, then maybe we can decrease that injury rate when we know they're probably going to knack themselves anyway. There's only one set I could find where we start looking at this stuff called core strength, because I think core strength is banded around, and I could talk for hours on core stability or core strength, I'm not going to, if you're okay. But it does seem that if you do have core strength, you can decrease your, inju your injury rate. And that seems to be the biggest buzzword. And certainly, you know, most physio practices around here, they'll do either um, um, skiing fitness classes, they'll do skillates, they'll do performance enhancement, they'll do the whole myriad of certain things. You know what, and I think they're good, as long as they're doing specific things, which I think are quite dynamic and quite functional. So I think anything is better than nothing at all, and certainly this core strength seems to work. But the problem is, and again, looking in sports health, and this is Carl Ettinger again, he said there are 12 myths to skiing, and this is number nine. He says, exercise is the best way to avoid skiing-related injuries. But the problem is, again, you then read into it, and some say, yes, it's fantastic. So others say, actually, you know what, to make a scrap of difference. And it comes in here, strong muscles have been shown to prevent the wind in World Cup skiers. So 94, 42% of the females... 10% of the blokes are up to their cruciates, and they're strong as oxes. So therefore, what's the point? But I think, and the bit which I highlighted, it's about common sense. And I think common sense must prevail in this. So I think we have to use common sense. We've got to do certain things that can help our patients. So I think we need to give them an understanding about ski. We should know about camber. We should know about rocker. We should know about reverse camber. We should know about side cut. We should know about tips. We should know about tails. We should know about radiuses and how they turn. Actually, if you have a big radius ski, it turns over a big arc, shorter radius, much quicker, much jumpier. So when we get figures like this, 122, 86, 115, you know, this is talking about the width in millimetres at the tip, at the width and in the tail. So you can work out the side cuts and how edgy they'll be. So, t so a ski that's got a skinny little side cut is actually going to be much more skittish. It's going to fly around much quicker. You go from edge to edge much quicker. But actually, if you have a shorter ski, it turns quicker, but it flaps around because it has poor surface area. And I think we should know things like this to at least give our patients the ability to understand more. I think we should tell them about boots as well. But it's not actually about boots, it's about the linings. Okay, ski boots are ski boots are ski boots. They're stiff, they're hard. When you read about linings, the guys who make the linings, they say that ski boots, after probably 20 days, the manufacturer's linings give up and they go south. They become flabby around by the ankle. And the better you can have foot control into your binding into your ski, the better you'll do. So these Bind, uh, these these uh, linings, which are very simple, they're heat moulded, you plonk them in, plonk them out, they stand nice and warm, they will actually give you better control and therefore they think less injuries. So after 20 days, take, take your, um, uh, your inners out and put new ones in instead. I think we should talk about bindings as well because bindings are massively important. And I think and these are the key messages. You know, never overestimate your skiing ability okay, and don't underestimate your weight. So when, when, the, when the guy in the shop who's doing your, your din settings up, your afro at the front of the back, always make sure you say, actually, I'm not that good. <coughs> you know what, am I, I'm going to underestimate my weight as well. Because I think that makes you safer. But I think there's a new type of binding as well, which is appearing, and this is called the knee binding. It comes from the States, and they claim that you cannot rupture your cruise ship with this. Okay, so it's a huge claim to make. And what the difference is, most bindings, the toes ping out, they go laterally. And that's it. So the toes do this, they go medial lateral, and that's kind of great. And the heels, what the heels do is go forwards and backwards. But the problem is, though, no binding apart from this one has the heel, which now goes medial laterally. So it's the only binding around that has this medial lateral change, and they think, therefore, that saves it from cruciates. And certainly, you know, they're looking at all the skiers who ski in it. It's very, very big in North America. No one on knee bindings has rupt their cruciate yet. But they have problems because somebody says yes and somebody says no. But I think we should know about these different bindings. I think especially for our boarders, we need to show them how to fall. And that's forwards, which you never think about doing, just get your bloody wrists out of the way. Land on your elbows. So you go forwards, elbows rather than wrists, because you will fracture your wrist. And the same thing about going backwards. Tuck yourself in. Don't put your hand down, okay? because you will fracture it. And we should be telling people this. We also have to give protection, as Brian was saying, about giving them good wrist guards to wear, because lots of people will fracture their wrists. And they're cheap, they're 40 quid. Give them some wrist guards. Give them something which is front and back to allow them to make the choice. I do think we have to give them the ability to move better and improve their balance. Because even though this guy may want to be skiing, and that's lovely, you know, he hasn't got enough ankle dorsiflexion, so he's going to have a massive patellofemoral joint reaction for, so he's got knee pain before he gets on the slopes. But it's because he hasn't got adequate hip flexion because he's got a really stiff thoracic spine. But someone like Lindsay Vaughan over here, she has. She's got the range, she's got the motion, she's got the wobbling, she's got all the things around it. So she's great. We need to give them that. But we also have to make it functional and dynamic and specific to what they need. And that's why bracing becomes quite important. Because they always worry about, do we brace, do we not brace? And me personally, if a patient says, shall I brace? I'm saying, well, should you be prepared to ski then? 
But there has been lots of nice research looking at bracing, especially for ACL-type injuries. And they've been running probably since the uh, early 2000s. Coach on the journal uh, uh, of knee surgery, he found out 180 deficient skiers. He says it's a high risk with unbraced. Uh, this is a physio weather beads, uh, the, uh, the American Physiotherapy Association. And she looks at four studies, and three of them said you should be bracing. And more recently, Sterrett, who's at the uh, Stedman Clinic up in Vale in Colorado, he looks at 280 skiers, and he said, actually, if you don't brace it, then you've got an over two times, almost a three times chance of bracing and re-rupturing your cruciate. So I think this bit of simple advice to give to our patients will help with the predictability to bring that down so our skiers have a safer time and don't nag so much. That's it.